hope you're all doing good. Guys, this uh, video is all about the labor and delivery, the triple R series. Hope you're all enjoying your uh, quick, uh, this quick series of preparation for your upcoming part two exam. Of course, I'm going to start with the labor and delivery module. I have tried to cover the most important topics so that it would be, uh, you know, like easy for you to answer in the exam. Okay. So to start with, yes, you have always been trying to do the best and you're almost there. Just hold on for a few days and you would be fantastic. Yeah, these are the hot topics to be very honest in the labor and delivery, which they would be asking. Uh, and labor and delivery, the basic and the most uh, questions which comes from is the intrapartum care, which are the killers. Apart from that, you have these topics as well. So let's kick start. To start with, I'm going to talk about the CTG. Obviously, the CTG implications, which you all know the basics of CTG, but I'm going to brush up so that it will be easy for your in exam. So paper speed for CTG should be one centimeter per minute so that it is, uh, uh, you know, like it would be uh, calculated like that. So each one box will be one minute. And obviously, so you will be assessing this in the mnemonic of Dr. C. Bravado. Please remember, you will never be going ahead and interpreting the CTG alone without the clinical scenario. This is one centimeter per minute. Okay. So... To see how uh, the CTG is in, uh, interpreted, can you, if you can see this one centimeter is one minute. So here you can see the decelerations. To tell accelerations and deceleration, it should be either increase or decrease of 20 beats per minute with loss more than 20 seconds. So here you can see, for example, this is lossing for one minute plus 30 seconds. So it is a 90 seconds. Okay, 90 seconds of deceleration and the fall is between from 180 to 165. So this is the heart rate, 165 to 180. So the fall of depth is 15 bits per minute. Here you can see one and two and three and the fall is 120 to 90. So the depth is 30 bits per minute. So you can go on assessing like that so that it would help you to uh, understand and interpret the CTG completely. So this is the basics. How do you go about and Dr. C. Bravado, as you guys are already aware, you have to define the risk, understand the clinical scenario, contractions, baseline heart rate, variability, accelerations could be there, need not be there, decelerations, and the overall impression, which we are going to talk in our upcoming slides. Fetal heart rate. So how do you assess the fetal heart rate? So it could be different at different places are the types because it can never be constant as you can see here it is 140 here it is 128 here it is 130 so it depends upon the like because the heartbeat increases and keep on decreasing however what are the recommendations which you need to know before they were all reassuring non-reassuring features now they follow the triad system just like the traffic light so the white amber and the red so the white is 110 to 160, which is a normal heart rate. Amber, if it is increasing in rate of 20 beats or 100 to 109, are unable to determine baseline. This is an important thing. And the red, less than 100 or more than 160. Okay. So you can see this is how you calculate because you have to draw a horizontal line going through the majority of the uh, trees. Okay. So what is the zone which you think it is? Okay. So this would be white because as you can see, the heart rate is around 130. Okay. When you come to this, so what is the heart rate here? You can see it is somewhere around 180. Obviously the zone will be red. Okay. So hope this, you are able to understand the basic concepts. And when you move to the variability, variability is a very important thing, which indicates intact autonomic nervous system. So beat to beat variability is very important. And how do you go about this? You will be taking the average amplitude in one minute segments. And how do you classify them? Okay. So basically you will be the normal beat to beat variability is 5 to 25, amber less than 5, but there is a time between 30 to 50 minutes or more than 25 for up to 10 minutes. These things you guys need to know when you interpret the CTG. It's timing. Less than 5 for 30 to 50 minutes, more than 25 for up to 10 minutes. And then when you come to the red, it is less than 5 for more than 50 minutes. Because what they mean is when the beta beat variability is less, they are going to give you more time. 
rather than when the beta beat variability is more, the duration could be less. Okay, so that is how you can remember. You need to know this. So what are the zones here? Okay, so we have three CTGs with a variable, uh, different variabilities. Let's look into this. Okay, so you need to know the zone. So this is a reduced variability. Obviously, it's a trace of 10 minutes. So that is why it is an amber. And here it is normal. So it is white. And here it is more than 25. So obviously, it is more than definitely 10 minutes. So obviously, that's the reason it is red. Now, when you get this um, trace for the B to B variability, where there is a smoothened thing, okay, where there is absence B to B variability and it is a sinusoidal pattern, this indicates fetal anemia and hypoxia. Definitely, this has to be the baby has to be taken out quicker, and this is red. There is something called a pseudo sinusoidal pattern. This is the sinusoidal, and pseudo sinusoidal is it is the shape is bell shaped, but they still maintain the B to B variability like this. Okay, so this is what is called pseudo sinusoidal, which you can see in case when you give uh, a labor analysis here like pethidine. Just an additional point. Okay, perfect. Now, when you get <clears throat> the diesel rations, as I said before. <clears throat> Guys, <clears throat> sorry, as I said before, the diesel rations are something which shows the dip in the heartbeat. So just to understand, I will be explaining them again. So there are three types of diesel rations early, which are actually quite okay to deal with late, which are dangerous, variable. It depends upon whether it is with concerning characteristics or not. And how do you go about the zones? As I said, early diesel rations are actually, they are quite friendly and it is white. The, here it is amber and I'll tell you why the zone is like that. This is a variable diesel ration. And the next is the late. Again, this would be amber. I'll tell you why we have chosen these zones. Okay. Because amber and why we have told variable and late as amber, not as red is because of the duration. You can see it is 10 and 20 and probably 22 minutes. Here are also the same thing. So it is less than 30 minutes. That is the reason I'm trying to tell you, you should know how long the trace is running. Okay. So a bit about the diesel rations. Basically, early diesel rations are the mirror image. So with the contraction, one very important thing, you cannot comment on the diesel rations without understanding the uh, without knowing the relationship with contraction. So here the contraction is like this. So obviously, they, this one, the diesel ration starting with the beginning, you can see it is starting with the beginning of the contraction. It is ending with the contraction itself. So it's a mirror image because it is just the opposite. You can see this is the contraction and this is the early uh, diesel ration. Obviously, mirror image and it, it is seen with head compression because when the head is get compressed, barrel receptors get activated. So through the vagal nerve, obviously, there is a dip in the heart rate. When you come to late deceleration, the word itself says it is late when compared to contraction. So with the peak of the contraction, the heartbeat starts dipping. And by the time the contraction is over, the nadir coordinates with the ending of the contraction, but it recovers later on. So if you see it is later to the contraction, that's why it is late deceleration. Definitely it's an ominous sign and it is not good. Okay, it is definitely not good. When you come to the variable deceleration, variable is nothing related with the contraction. It can happen. It is neither mirror nor it is late. You can see that it has started and ended within the contraction, but not a mirror image. Obviously, there are some things which you need to know. Variable decelerations are one of the commonest, which can be seen with the card compression. However, if they have a concerning characteristics, what do I mean by concerning characteristics like this? Generally, when the baby's heartbeat is going to fall, there will be a bit of a rise and it falls. And again, it goes a little bit high and then only comes back. A little bit of a rise. That is what is called normal shouldering. However, if it is overdone like this, if it is overshooting, that means the baby is really trying to compensate more to come back to normal, then it is abnormal or absolutely no shouldering. That is concerning characteristics. And to be very honest, you can see when the variable decelerations are happening, it is maintaining the beat-to-beat -beat variability. It is never smooth. When there is a smoothening at trough, 
you have to be careful. It is concerning characteristics. And as you can see here, generally, with the once the deceleration is coming back, it has to come back in the normal way. It shouldn't take a lot of time to get back. If it is taking a lot of time to get back, which is a late recovery, that means the baby is trying to wash off the acids a lot. So that is the reason it is taking time. So the baby is more compromised. So this is again a concerning characteristics. And when you come to this, which is a W pattern, that is the heartbeat is falling, the baby is trying to make up, again it is falling, again it is trying to pick up. So it's a biphasic deceleration. So these are the things which you need to remember concerning characteristics, overshooting, absence of shouldering, smoothening at rough, late recovery, biphasic deceleration. When you see any of these with a the variable deceleration, then definitely it indicates it is not a simple variable deceleration. You should be really alert the baby is not really doing good. So, and with the concerning characteristics, what are the thing which you need to remember? Okay, so I think I've already told you this, the features I've showed you. And what are the different decelerations? How do you categorize them into zone? White, as I said, early decelerations are quite friendly. So it is white. Variable decelerations that are not evolving to have uh, concerning characteristics. This is a new one actually. So like if they do not have a, a variable contraction, variable, I mean, concerning characteristics, that means to say it is still in white. Okay. But they have not mentioned the time that you have to note. When you come to amber, if it is a repetitive variable deceleration with any concerning characteristics for less than 30 minutes or with concerning characteristics more than 30 minutes or late decelerations for less than 30 minutes. Guys, you need to know this. I'm not actually trying to uh, like repeat this and confuse you guys, you need to know the timings. That is what helps you in the exams if they give the tricks. Uh, they might give you in the uh, writing also, like this concept contraction has been for 40 minutes or 50 minutes. And red, with any concerning characteristics, if it's repetitive, more than 30 minutes, or if you have a prolonged acute bradycardia. So remember the rule of 12, if there is a prolonged bradycardia, we say once it is more than three minutes. So ideally, it has to, you immediately start the conservative measures and you would be either going for an instrumental delivery or a cesarean section the baby has to be out as quickly as possible because with every minute the ph of the baby is falling so ideally by 12 minutes baby has to be out that is what we call rule of 12 in case of prolonged bradycardia perfect guys and now you have got all the different ones so what is the overall impression so if there is everything is white you go normal if suspicious, when do you call? When one is amber also, it is suspicious. However, if it is two ambers or one red, you go for pathological. So remember, it is normal, suspicious and pathological. Now, let's look into a couple of the CTGs, okay? You can see this is a CTG trace, obviously, assuming it's at one centimeter per minute, how you will be assessing. Obviously, I haven't given the scenario just to keep it crisp. So you can see... You can see the variable deceleration. You can see the it's it's actually prolonged uh, deceleration is there as well. And some of them are late as well. So there is a lot of uh, decelerations which you can see in this trace. Plus there is a variability is decreased. So it and also you can see the contractions. How many are there? Okay. So it is a recurring hypoxia. Could be due to take a systole, you don't know. So you have to look into, if you have put the prostaglandin pessary, please remove it and also stop oxytocin if she's on and make sure that she gets turbitalin. The point is, there are two things. If the contractions is more than five in 10 minutes, without any concerning characteristics in CTG, you just remove the factor like oxytocin or prostaglandin or whatever you have put like a uh, prostaglandin pessary. If it is associated with problems like this, where the baby is also hypoxic with tachycystole, you need to make sure to give terbitalin as well. Obviously, this is a very clear cut thing, which is pathological. Okay, obviously. So by the look of it only, it will help you to understand. And when we come to this, okay, look at the CTG. So what is happening with the heart rate? You can see it is falling and falling, right? So initial baseline was 140, but later on it is falling true accelerations are there and as well as there is repetitive late and prolonged deceleration we don't know probably if it is picking up here so you can see uh, that we don't know the continuation of the trace probably it is picking up if not actually you can see like you have to deliver the baby very very quickly 
okay and reduce variability is there as well so it is purely pathological the moment you look into that without even dr c bravado you know how to interpret what about this again you can see the heart rate there is a prolonged bradycardia here right so that itself can help you initially baseline is 134 there is an acceleration here you can see the accelerations here even though it is minimal and you can see the prolonged deceleration see one two three four five six seven actually so the baby has to be out very quickly and definitely it's a pathological ctg and let's move to the next scenario i'm just trying to help you to get the a zone or get the category very quickly at a glimpse because you have an EMQ only one minute, right? So what's happening here? Here the baseline is 168 beats per minute. Accelerations are there and there is deceleration which is non-repetitive and you can call this as early deceleration and there is a normal variability. So why even with everything? So the look of it, you might feel this is normal, but because of the baseline heart rate, this goes into suspicious. Remember, one amber is suspicious. Okay. Hope you guys are enjoying this one because it is important to know the CTG in your real scenarios as well. Okay. So again, here what is happening? I think that's the same CTG which I showed you. Now the next CTG. Okay. So you can see here, again, coming back to the things, it's pathological. Now, you can, how do you get the questions on? It could be single best answer. It could be, it could be an EMQ. Let's look at this. Okay, let's read the scenario. So obviously it's a 34 year old primary, 39 weeks, admitted in labor ward with regular contraction. Examination, she was found to five centimeters dilated. Four hours later, re-examine and still five centimeters. So there is a problem in progression of labor. Fetal weight at 36 was 2.8, so it's fine. Strong family history of diabetes mellitus, okay, but OGTT was normal. Appropriate next step, CTG is as follows. Before I go into this, I will definitely look into what is a CTG. It's absolutely a normal and a fantastic CTG. So I'm only worried about the delay in first stage. So what do I do? Definitely, because they haven't told me the membranes are absent, I go for the amniotomy. Because generally, if you have a lot of things, for example, there could be an option of only amniotomy. Okay, so they could give you only amniotomy. In this case, if you think option D and option N, this is a more complete option. Delay in first stage, offer amniotomy and repeat vaginal examination into us. So I would definitely go for this rather than N. Okay. So guys, just analyze. You will be fantastic. Let's move to the next one. The CTG preservation. Now, obviously, there is an intermittent auscultation which you do for the low-risk pregnancy and there is a CTG which you do for the high-risk. Okay, I'm not going into those details. CTG preservance, generally, if everything is fine, they are usually kept for 25 years. However, whenever you see that there is a uh, probable injury to the baby, hypoxic injury, it has to be stored indefinitely because the babies who develop HIEs are the like, CPs, they can do the litigation at any point of time. So they can claim litigation. So it has to be stored indefinitely. Perfect, guys. Now, hope that was useful. And just a word of caution, make sure you guys go through the labor care guide, the different segments. Sometimes the EMQs could be, they could have the labor care guide. Let's move to the EMQ. <clears throat> labor and delivery EMQs, obviously, it's a terror for majority of you. However, if you follow the tips, okay, like reading the question carefully, I will be doing one or two EMQs for you to understand. The lead-in statement is your friend. Second thing is always looking at the gestational age because you need to know preterm, term, vacuum, or forceps, cesarean section, or what, parity, primary paras, multi paras, grand multi paras, analgesia, epidural, antinox, or probably water birth, or sterile water, or PCA right? Station. Okay. They would never give you it's at zero plus one plus two. They would be telling you it is at spines or it is one centimeter below, one centimeter above spines, two centimeter below, two centimeter above spines. So they would be giving you something like that. Positions, occipital anterior, occipital posterior, breech, cephalic, what it is, right? And also the hours, which is in labor. Okay. The commencement of the second stage. I would be talking a little bit about the hours in coming slides. 
and obviously CTG if they have mentioned. If they haven't mentioned anything about the CTG, that means to say that, guys, CTG is normal. So just for your understanding, okay? And if you follow this, obviously from terror, you would be, the reaction of terror too, you would become happy because it's always one important tip which I want to give you while you are doing labor and delivery MQs. Put that clinical vignette, that patient in your mind that she's in front of you. Then obviously you would uh, think, analyze and definitely what you choose is going to be correct. Now, a bit about the progress of the labor. I'm sure all of you know this very well. So once the woman enters the active stage, active phase of first stage of labor, okay, ideally, irrespective of the parity, I'm talking about the low-risk pregnancies, They you have to be doing a vaginal examination fourth hourly, not before that, and the dilatation would be two centimeters in four hours. Like, it has to be at least two centimeters in four hours, irrespective of the parity. Once it is less than two centimeters in four hours, what do you do is if the membranes are intact, go for amniotomy. So because amniotomy, you know, it releases the natural prostaglandins and you would be doing a vaginal examination after two hours, okay, to see what is the progress. If somebody doesn't progress, for example, you have done an amniotomy and you're examining after two hours, if the dilatation is less than one centimeter in two hours, Okay, that means to say still it is a delay and you have diagnosed a delay, you can go for oxytocin depending upon what is the parity. If somebody is a previous cesarean section or somebody who is a, like a multi grand multi paras, you need to discuss with consultant and start this. With the oxytocin, when do you assess this? Four hours. Obviously, after four hours, if more than two centimeters, it's absolutely fine. Less than two centimeters, you should assess, especially for the multiparous or even for the nulliparous, you should look in terms of cephalopelvic disproportions, small positions, and how would you go about delivering the patient. Now, a word of importance, why amniotomy two hours, why oxytocin four hours? It has to be same, right? However, the point is, with amniotomy, you cannot titrate the amount of prostaglandins you would be releasing because it's a natural method, right? So uh, that's the reason you want to make sure that you will assess her after two hours. However, when you come to the oxytocin, you are iatrogenically giving, you can always titrate based on the number of contractions she's getting. That's the reason you are sure and you will be giving after four hours, okay? You have to assess after four hours. Hope that's clear. Duration of labor. Yes, this is what I wanted to speak about. Guys, duration of labor is all about, the college is trying to tell you what is the maximum duration of the labor, okay? Uh, for a nulliparous and a multiparous, that's what the Green Top Guidelines is looking at. Like if a nulliparous who is not on any analgesia, by the end of two hours, including active and passive, the baby has to be out. When you take the multiparous, it has to be one hour. Okay, one hour of active and passive pushing, the baby has to be out. If epidural is there, you add one hour, like two plus one for nulliparous, one plus one for multiparous. However, if you will not jump on applying the forceps just because she has finished three hours or two hours or one hour because the guideline mentions. It only mentions that you have to be ready to deliver the baby by then. Okay, you keep everything ready. Okay, so the, the difference between NICE and GTG is the NICE talks essentially the same. However, the GTG talks explicit about the epidural. So follow this and remember, it is not about, for example, somebody is pushing. We, I have a scenario as well, which I'll be talking about. Somebody is pushing and they're going to deliver in another half an hour. CTG is fine. You don't jump and put the forceps. So it is a customized answer for which your patient you need to begin rather than applying white and it is never white and black. Okay. You have to look into all the scenarios and then go ahead and do the things. Okay. Now, instrumental deliveries. Okay, you all know what is outlet, what is low, what is mid cavity. The important question which you guys always ask me about is which one to apply, forceps or vacuum? Few things. Forceps, if at all, if it is rotational, you can use both forceps or vacuum. Okay, if you think if it is a preterm, obviously you know the gestational cutoff 32 to 36 or less than 32, you need to be careful about the vacuum. Less than 32, you shouldn't be because of the 
uh, trauma it causes to the caput, uh, I mean, the scalp of the baby and more of retinal hemorrhages and things like that. When the mother is extremely tired, you always think of going for the forceps because in a vacuum, the mother also has to push. Okay. So based on the stations, what it has got. Okay. So you need to know, because as I said, they will be giving you two centimeters below the spine, three centimeters below the spine at spine. So you need to cal classify the operative delivery like that. And the place of delivery outlet, you can do in labor room, low forceps, you can do in labor room. If mid cavity, please understand this. It is never a general statement that all mid cavities have to be delivered in theater. No. If it is a multi parous lady who is on good analgesia, no mall positions, you can still deliver her in the labor room itself. However, rotational, uh, difficult rotational ones are uh, occipital posterior with a higher BMI, not on good analgesia, you would want to definitely shift her to the theater. Okay, I'm going to talk about them in these scenarios. So if you take these scenarios, but these are very important and a simple ones. Primary gravida, who is a low risk, term gestation, head and perineum, <clears throat> no concerns. And I mean, CTG has been fine. Two hours is over. That's the only concern which you have got. And she is uh, on Entenox. <clears throat> As you know, Entenox is a gas mixture, right? Nitrous oxide. So she is not on epidural. That's what we mean. So what do you do and where do you deliver her? The thing is, point is, if just because she's to us and she's not on any analgesia, you won't be telling, okay, let me put the forceps at the vacuum. You can see that she's advancing well. Obviously, the whole scenario, they would be giving you that she's at plus two and with each contraction, it is coming on plus three. You allow her to push and she would be able to deliver in some time. This is what I mean to say that it doesn't mean the numbers, if they have given, it doesn't mean that you have to push and you have to push her to go for an instrumental delivery. Remember, natural route of delivery and natural delivery has always got a better uh, out, a better outlook for the mother and the baby. <clears throat> Next one. Multiparous at 39 weeks on epidural, okay? Occipital anterior. Now to us over station is at spines. Okay, so this is what I was trying to tell. Somebody who is uh, obviously a multiparous lady, occipital anterior, and I'm not expecting any rotation, difficult rotation. She's on epidural, so analgesia is fantastic. So I can still go on instrumental delivery in labor room. Obviously, I have to inform my consultant and the pediatrician. The next one, multiparous, term gestation, no pain relief. Head is at spine. Occipito anterior and she has been like probably pushing from last one hour. So you might be thinking, can I put the forceps in labor room? No, the reason being because she is not on like, you know, like not on any great pain relief. You can think that I would be giving a pudendal block. Okay, I'll be giving a pudendal block and pulling out the baby. However, with the parental block, what happens? Uh, like it is, it takes some time to act as well. And also it might not give effective analgesia because you have to uh, take the baby from the spine. Okay, so it definitely need a better analgesia. That's the reason you should be shifting her to the theater for a better analgesia. <clears throat> Sorry guys, my voice was a little bit in trouble today. So the next one, multiparous at 38 weeks has been fully dilated and pushing for two hours. She's examined and found to be fully dilated. Left occipital anterior position, vertex one centimeter below is scale spines with one plus caput and no molding. Whenever caput is being given, just look what is the degree of the caput, okay? And what do you want to do for her? For her, for sure, because she is on a left occipital anterior and it is at a one centimeter below spine, there is no problem. So you can always deliver her in the labor room itself. Okay. The next one, again, 39 weeks on epidural occipital anterior and two hours over station at spine. This we have discussed. Good analgesia. So two hours over and you know that from spines to the actually like, uh, you know, like probably uh, uh, giving her 
one more hour doesn't make sense and she's already on epidural. So obviously pushing would be less. So you can put the instrumental delivery in the room. And the next one, multiparous, 37 weeks, right occipital posterior at spines on epidural analgesia and the BMI is 38. So I know that there is an increased possibility of failure Okay, because right occipital posterior rotation is required. Obese women, even the multiparasol epidural, I would want to shift it to the theater for trial. Whenever you speak of trial, it's understood you will be doing in theater. So hopefully, guys, these scenarios have given you a insight of how to do. So always look into what is the parity, what is the gestational age, and how long she has been pushing, what is the analysis she's on, any mall positions, and any other risk factors. Based on that, you can pick up your answers. Okay, so just understand the concepts, you'd be fantastic. Let's move on to the killers, the EMQs. So when you see a question like this in the exam, okay, so if I was in your place, the first thing which I would watch or read is this, because I need to understand what I need to look in for this one. So the scenarios explain women on different situation, appropriate management. So I'm more interested in this. Obviously, there are different ways. People read the scenario. People actually go through the choices. But my personal opinion would be I always read the lead-in statement. Then I go through the scenario completely, irrespective of however big it is. Okay. And then I take it from there. So here are the scenario. I would be taking you to the next slide so that I can show you how to read the scenario. I'll come back to the previous one. Don't worry. So whenever I'm reading, I start marking virtually in my mind. 23-year-old, multi-paris, 41 weeks. So I know that it is a post-slated young patient, multi-paris, post-stated. Uh, the uh, antenatal care was complicated with admission to hospital. Okay, sorry. This is a primary gravida, guys. So I think it's P1, probably it is a primary gravida who has undergone induction of labor at 41 in her first pregnancy. Antenatal care complicated with admission to hospital with APH at 34. So this is definitely not a low risk. The symptoms settled spontaneously and all investigations and monitoring were normal. Blood group was AB positive. Fantastic. Vaginal gel insertion established uh, labor within three hours and labor progress such that four hours late with cervix was five centimeters dilated. Meconium stain. I would keep a mark. Okay, she went into active labor after induction. Meconium stain. Epidural analgesia words instigated. Very good. Two hours later, fetal head was thought not fifth palpable. That is zero fifth palpable abdominally. Nine centimeters dilated. The position was left occipital anterior. That's again very important. Minimal capital malting. CTG had a baseline of 165 beats. No base well, variability that is concerning again. No accelerations, no deceleration, small amount of post-examination with general bleeding, fetal heart rate, 85 beats, and does not recover. Okay. So the point is somebody who has been treated for APH, she was induced, she was progressing well. Meconium stain is there, decreased variability. However, the heart rate is falling automatically. My first reaction would be, let me jump and do a cesarean section. You have to take out the baby very quickly, but do not forget the option of having uh, her deliver quickly because she's nine centimeters. Obviously, nine centimeters, you might not be able to deliver also depending upon the station. So what you can do. So you have an option of delivery of category one, category two. And if you have any, uh, like probably there is nothing for, you know, like I can't see anything on an instrumental delivery. There could be, they could be giving you forceps delivery or vacuum as well. But I would be searching for an option. Generally, what all we do, whenever we shift the patient who is going to be fully dilated before the cesarean section, we always transfer to the theater and make sure you do a reassessment, isn't it? We all do that. We all do that so that she can be, you can do an general examination and see if she's fully dilated, whether you can go for mid cavity or whatever, the station, based on the station, you can deliver her quickly, right? So this is where it uh, you can feel it is tricky because people would, 90% of people would mark category one. If operative delivery is there, some of them can mark vacuum or forceps, but always think what you would have done. Because whenever you see things like this, you should always go for 
thinking if I have an option like that. So the moment you start thinking, you can never go wrong. Okay, hope that was helpful. Let's move to the next one. Again, this is the same one where you're supposed to be doing an appropriate management. Okay, and obviously, what is the management option for this lady? So again, I would be reading in this way. As I read, I mark in my mind, 31-year-old, first pregnancy, BMI of 25. Okay, overweight, spontaneous labor. That's fantastic. Post-stated 41. After a straightforward normal pregnancy, she has had most of her antenatal care with community midwife. That means to say she was low risk so far. <clears throat> However, she's reporting reduced fetal movements for the last 24 hours. That is concerning. Small amount of fresh vaginal bleeding prior to admission. Okay. She's distressed and contracting four times every 10 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> And see, Pfizer Fundalite is 34. Okay. <clears throat> there could be some element of small for gestation. <clears throat> and what's happening? Uh, she has a longitudinal life, cephalic with two-fifths palpable, the general examination, five centimeters dilated, it is vertex, right occipital lateral with minimal capital molding. So things are okay. Active labor, probably we are dealing with an IUGA with reduced fetal movement with some amount of APH, you can't say, don't know. Let's read further on. Blood stain like a draining. So as I said, <clears throat> in cases of abruption with IUGA, that's what you're looking into. And what about the CTG? Normal baseline, but little or no baseline variability. This would be concerning. That means to say there could be an element of chronic hypoxia in IUGA with abruption. So what is the thing which you would be doing? She's five centimeters dilated. So the obvious choice is category one cesarean section. Okay. So basically, when you analyze like this, you can never go wrong. They could be, see, in here, they have given category one, category two. They could just give you cesarean section also option. When the scenario is crystal clear, you have to choose the option, which is most appropriate and most suitable. Now, <clears throat> Hope I'm adding value to your preparation, guys. Okay, so now let's look at the lengthier single best answer. When you have a single best answer like this, <clears throat> I would always read the last line first. What is the most appropriate management? Because I need to know before reading what am I looking at. So for this scenario, I need to search for the appropriate management. As a labor ward speciality trainee on call, you ask to review a Nali Paras woman who has been pushing for 80 minutes. Okay. So roughly around <clears throat> 1 or 20 minutes. She had a low risk pregnancy and has been aiming for a water bath. Okay. She had made adequate progress and found to be fully dilated to us previously. To us, fully dilated and uh, she has been like pushing almost like to 80 minutes. So the time frame is almost getting over. Pushing had been delayed until she felt the arch. Okay, she has started pushing now only. She's now out of the pool and CTG comments. She's tired, no longer coping. Okay, fine. Examination, appropriately grown fetus. That's fantastic. No head palpable abdominally. So I can go with the my instrumental delivery if I wish. Vaginal examination, fully dilated. Head plus one to spine. Okay, to the left occipital transverse position with one plus cap put, one plus molding. Liker is clear and CTG is reassured. Now, I know that she has to be going for uh, like instrumental delivery. I don't think she would be needing a cesarean section because nothing uh, nothing serious for the mother or the baby. So I have a few things here. Forceps delivery in room, trial of instrumental delivery in theater, Ventus delivery in the room. We are talking about a Nalli Paras woman who is tired, who is not on analgesia, left occipital transverse at plus one. So we are talking about a mid-cavity delivery in an early paras woman who is very tired, but the CTG looks fine. So obviously, Ventus delivery in the room, Ventus is, you can apply, but there is some amount of caputin molding and she is tired. Once somebody is very tired, you can't ask them to push because you know that Ventus, mother, you need a mother cell. Forceps delivery in the room, I would go for forceps for sure, but do I want to do in the room? That is my choice. That is my question. 100% I don't want to do in the room because of a couple of things. One, she is not on analgesia. So you can't be putting there and also left occipital transverse. So I need to do a rotational delivery for which I need to shift her to the theater. That's what it says, trial of instrumental delivery in theater. So this is how you boil down the choices. When you think, you can never go wrong. 
I hope this is helpful. Let's move on. A couple of things about intrapartum care of twins. Okay, so my humble request would be, you need to know the low risk pregnancy. You need to know about the high risk pregnancies. Okay, because if somebody is on, I'm not covering that because I'm only focusing on the low risk pregnancies here. You need to know if somebody is on uh, anticoagulants or uh, like a mitral valve stenosis are uh, probably, you know, you need to know those little bit of a changes as well. Twins, obviously it depends upon the gestation, like the position, what they have, so cephalic to cephalic, cephalic to breech, breech to transverse. Obviously non-cephalic uh, presentations, a cesarean section could be the best one. However, if the first twin is cephalic, obviously you will deliver normally and you will make sure that she has an IV access, epidural analysis, a pediatrician is informed, everybody is around. After the delivery of the first baby, you always try to look for the position of the next baby and probably you have to be needing to do a manopause. For example, if the second baby is transverse, so the first is cephalic, cephalic, the baby has delivered and the second is transverse. In that case, what you need to be doing is you need to shift her to the theater. After the delivery of the first baby, shift her to the theater and do an internal podalic version and breach extraction in cases of transverse life. So there is always a question which people ask, what is the protocol? Generally, if it is a transverse line, you will be shifting to the theater and try to do an ECV, okay? To be very honest, ECV in fully dilated, the chances of failure is more. So that is the reason you go for internal podalic version and assisted breech extraction. This is the only where only place where you use assisted breech extraction. So just focus on that, okay? Perfect, let's move on. A couple of things for the VT score. Remember, like for uh, four scenarios I've put out to give a clarity about what is a VT score postpartum you give. Mid-cavity rotational forceps as such carries a score of one. Okay. Prolonged labor of 36 hours with a simple operative delivery. Here, prolonged labor is the one which is more than 24 hours is one which is carrying a score of one. Simple left out of, for example, it was a simple outlet forceps there is no score given purely for operative delivery. Quick progress with difficult operative delivery. Again, here, difficult operative delivery, you are going to give a score of one. VTE is very, very important, guys. You need to know because you'll be getting the EMQs as well. Now, a bit about labor analysis here. So, patient-controlled analysis here. So, generally, remifentanil is the one uh, which are offered. Obviously, there are lots of options like the Entenox, which is gas. Pethidine, which can be used even in the midwifery units, or you can use in the hospital patient controlled analgesia, or you can use uh, the epidural, which is one of the most effective. Okay, definitely patient controlled analgesia, it, uh, they actually prolong the need for epidural and but they need a monitoring. There could be, there should be a midwife, there should be a CTG, and obviously monitoring of the respiratory function and this can only be given hospital units because anesthetic report, anesthetic support, anesthesia team is required if there is a respiratory depression. Now, the newer thing is all about the sterile water, which I'll be talking about. And if somebody chooses water bath, which is actually a natural method of pain relief, make sure that the temperature of the water should not be more than 37.5. Okay. However, if you're giving sterile water injection, you can tell her that she might like get the relief of back pain in 10 minutes and it could last up to three hours. And how do you give the four different injection points and add traumas of Michaels and you can you can know the dose because this is a newer thing and I think you all need to be aware. Of course, uh, that's something which is uh, important for counseling the woman. And generally, the anesthetist is the one who talks about in the low-risk women, low-risk pregnancies at 36 weeks, they do talk to the pregnant woman about analgesi options. The most asked question, reason for referral from home to hospital. Okay, there are three units, home, Somebody can have home birth. The midwifery, there are two things. One is the midwifery unit, standalone midwifery, which is completely managed by midwives, alongside midwifery unit, where in the hospital they've got a midwifery unit. And the fourth is obstetric unit of the hospital unit. So if you want to understand what are the reasons, so okay, this is based on the study which they have done. So remember the first thing is progress of, uh, like delay in progress of first stage or second stage. Next comes the meconium, 
then perineal trauma, abnormal fetal heart rate, unlike what we think is the fourth reason, and regional analgesia is the fifth one. Okay. And a bit of percentages, I'm sure all of you will be perfect with this now. So 45% of the women tend to get to transfer. You can remember half of the women. Okay. 45% adverse effect to baby in the primary gravida at home birth is around 9 per thousand. When you think the contrast in multi is 11.5% get transported and adverse effect to babies 3 per thousand. This is very, very important when you counsel the women for the same. Okay. So guys, that ends my labor and delivery thing. I have covered, try to cover a few important salient points. Our vision for you is to get this beautiful letter from the college saying that we are, they are very pleased to tell you that you can progress to part three. Hope you are all enjoying. Remember, to be kind to yourself and remember to revise, repeat, analyze. Labor and delivery are quite a doable task. You would definitely be doing if you analyze and go on. God bless and stay blessed. Thank you, guys.